Good morning, everybody, again. Uh, thanks for joining us today on what is, believe it or not, the 10th um, episode of The Artist Well. Now, having said that, it's actually the 22nd of me getting up early on Saturdays in order to do this, because straight after lockdown, um, which was announced on St. Patrick's Day, if you recall, all that way back, um, the 21st was the first Saturday after that. And we, I've been doing a Facebook Live for every single Saturday um, since then, which is 22 weeks, would you believe, and 22 um, uh, events. Um, and I'm delighted the way the whole thing has developed because we had no intention of doing this. It was, it was literally just a way of, you know, keeping in touch with people um, during lockdown, um, talking to students who, who were due to do my work or my, my course, um, and, you know, allowing them keep up with some tips and techniques and so on, and practice during, during the isolation. So that kind of developed after about 12 weeks. I thought, right, we've come to a natural ending in that. And I think phase two had kicked in at that point. Um, and I was looking for feedback and I got this sort of feeling that people loved the idea of uh, looking at other people's workspace and, and seeing their work practice, understanding how they work. Because I think because artists tend to work in isolation already, uh, and that commonly was heard back time and time again from people that they said, well, actually, it doesn't make any difference to me. I'm here alone, you know, uh, in, in, in splendid isolation anyway. But the reality was that people still need to keep in touch. Um, uh, and they do love to see what other people are doing, um, how they're doing it, uh, and all of that sort of thing. So the, the artist well uh, was created as a resource, a form of inspiration for other artists so that we can visit a particular artist well, or indeed anybody who's in, in, involved in the arts, and pick up ideas, you know, get a bit of inspiration, find out how they, you know, save space in their studio. Uh, all of these sort of things are of interest to other artists, I think you'd agree. Um, but there's a lot, there's a big bad world out there as well, you know, that is not just in studios, and it's out in the real world of commerce. And I'm delighted today that uh, that's one direction that we're going in today, which is, to, to view a gallery, all right? To see how a gallery works, uh, to view an exhibition, and to ask questions about what it's like to be a gallery owner. And I'm thrilled to have Olivier Cornet of the Olivier Cornet Gallery in Dublin as our special guest today. So Olivier, how are you? You, come in, you can come in now. I'm good, I hope you can hear me. I'm actually standing just outside the gallery, the gallery yeah. building on Three Great Denmark Street. Yes. I just wanted, to, just for people who've never come to us, just to show you where we are. Uh, in the distance, you can see this neo-Gothic church, which is the church at the top of Palm Square. And we are on Great Denmark Street that starts as a Gardner Row. So the streets change its name, so don't get confused about that. But it changes names as you reach Barry's Hotel, and I think you can see the sign just in front of you. And opposite us is Belvedere Hotel. And next to us is Belvedere House, followed by Belvedere College. Mm. The building where my gallery is belongs to um, Belvedere College. So Belvedere College is my landlord. So um, I'll, I'll walk into the gallery. Just give me time to close the door. I'm on my own at the moment. Um, yep. So just give me time. I just have to go down. Yes. Move the fire, fire extinguisher. So, this is the, um, really the hall, the entrance hall to the gallery. Um, I'm sharing this space with other tenants. Um, so the gallery is on the base, um, uh, on the ground floor, and um, in the building we have other people. We have, one of my artists is in the building as well, Kelly Ratchford, she has a studio. We have the very famous um, theatre production company, um, Fish Amble. We have an art psychotherapist, we have a journalist, we have a playwright, we have the Irish fashion designer Natalie B. Coleman here as well. So the, the building is full of um, creative people, just to put, it, to put it that way. I was the first tenant to move in here, so I was lucky enough to be able to actually use the entrance hall and uh, you can actually see already uh, works of art and um, different beats and pieces. Um, here, for instance, um, the first time one of my artists got a review in the famous Irish Arts Review magazine that was Owen McLaughlin for his 2015 show. 
uh, diaspora. And again, there's a few works of art already. Some of you might recognize the character uh, featured or depicted in that painting, and we can go back to it later if you haven't guessed, um, just to give you a clue that's from the film or inspired from the film Babette's Feast. So a beautiful painting by Jordi Forn is here. But maybe before we, we walk into uh, the gallery, um, maybe just to give you a bit of information about myself, um, people always wonder what is a French gallerist um, doing in Dublin? And um, when I came to Ireland in the late 80s, um, not to work in the arts uh, originally, I studied languages. I'm a linguist um, by training. And I came to Ireland in 1988, um, that's me there, <laughs> to work as, as a translator. And um, first in the IT industry, really, technical translations. And um, stayed in Ireland for three years. And then at the time, the French military service was still compulsory. So I had to leave Ireland and I was sent to, to Malawi um, in Africa to head the French Cultural Centre of Lilongwe, the capital city of the country. And my job at the centre was to teach French, but also to organise arts exhibitions. Mm -hmm. So that's really how I got into the arts yeah. uh, initially. Came back to Dublin uh, in sort of the, in the mid 90s, resumed my career as a translator, but really, I really, really wanted to work in the arts. So what I did was I applied for a weekend job in a gallery, in any scary, the Metatron Gallery with the great Monica Morin, learned about Irish arts, and to cut a long story short, started organizing art exhibitions in various places in Dublin, and Doki Castle, Fim Bay, Smog Alley Theatre, and then in 2012, at the peak of the recession, decided to open my first gallery, which I did in Temple Bar, the famous wooden building. And I was there for a couple of years. Then I moved to this area of Dublin simply because I felt that Temple Bar was not really the cultural sort of um, center that it was supposed to become. And I came to this area of Dublin, Dublin Inner City, uh, the Pound Square, because it's supposed to become the new cultural quarter of Dublin. So initially I moved to a place called Five Cam and this row, uh, lost my gallery because the, uh, the building was sold. And then Beverly College heard about my plight <laughs> and offered me uh, this space here um, at 3 Great Denmark Street, uh, where I am now. It's an old Georgian building which was recently uh, refurbished. And so really the gallery is on on the on on the ground floor now this is a normal entrance to the gallery but before be, because of covid 19 and we reopened in june 8 we are asking people to walk into the gallery through our browse area which is also our storage area mm -hmm. so that they can exit through the other door and, and sorry can i interrupt you there uh, sure you there for a second um Olivia, do, 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 can people just walk in off the street or do they have to make a, an appointment? Not at the moment. Uh, at the moment, we yeah. prefer appointments. Okay. Um, the main thing, and I've been doing that since early June, we've been asking people to wear a mask and that has worked quite well. Now, as you know, masks are absolutely compulsory everywhere, but we were the first, one of the first sort of galleries in Dublin to do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy that we did because people felt very comfortable or have been feeling very comfortable and safe in the gallery. So at the moment, it's wear a mask and preferably make an appointment. Uh, it's just so that, you know, you can enjoy the experience fully knowing that you're on your own basically in the gallery and you don't have to watch your steps you know looking at an exhibition can be tricky if you if you want to go back you know look at the previous work and there's somebody looking at it already so for me and uh, to kind of uh, ensure a, a, a great experience in the gallery that's the only way you know that so when you come to the gallery at the moment if you've made an appointment there's only me basically and possibly one of my interns or volunteers. Yeah. Uh, we're open every day except on Mondays. So, but yeah, appointments are preferable. And when I say appointments, all you have to do is just let me know, texting, phoning, or emailing me. Just let me know what time you intend to come. And that are, you, are you open on Sundays? Up. You say you're closed. Monday. Yes. Yeah, wow. we, I, I'm open six days a week. That's oh, um, quite unique, good. actually, about the Olivier Cromer yeah. Gallery. Uh, simply because when I was in a position to buy art many years ago. I enjoy the idea of being able to walk into a gallery on a Sunday afternoon, you know, and uh, 
um, this is when the gallery can get busy actually at the weekends, you know. So yeah, yeah I'm only there's so many, on Mondays. Yeah, there's so many other places in the vicinity to visit as well. You've got the Writers yes. Museum. The yes, but there's gallery. another commercial gallery, uh, mm -hmm. the great John Daly with the Hillsborough Gallery. Yep. Great, great contemporary art gallery, but we also have obviously, um, and I have to get the name right. They're very, uh, uh, it's uh, Dublin City Gallery, the U Lane, the U -Lane. Um, yes. Yes. brilliant, yes. brilliant um, museum, really. Yeah. Um, and then we have obviously um, the, the, the Gen Joy Center, and I'll talk about that. I collaborate with the Gen Joy Center every year for our Bloomsday exhibition thematic exhibition in june every year um you have the dublin writers center i mean you have a lot of different people poetry ireland is is nearby so yeah it's it's a great area and and again it is to become the new sort of cultural quarter of dublin so hopefully i'm in the right area very good Okay, so let, let's take a visit around your, your uh, current yeah, exhibition. So, Tell us a bit about uh, that. We're walking through, uh, actually, you know, we're coming through, um, first, this is our browse area. It's, it's an organized chaos. Basically, it is our storage area with the difference that we're allowing members of the public to have a free browse. And we'll come back to that room later. Um, because yep. obviously, you know, when people come to the gallery, we want them to see uh, the current exhibition. So this is our main uh, exhibition room. My desk is behind this sort of a set of a plinth there. Mm -hmm. um, and this exhibition called Resurfacing uh, was not really planned. Basically last year, uh, when I heard that one of my artists, um, the portraits, the plant portraitist or botanical artist, Yanni Peters was going to exhibit in the National Gallery uh, which, by the, way, I, by the way, this exhibition is still on at the moment, with a group of other botanical artists. Mm. I offered them all to exhibit with me in August this year. When uh, COVID erupted, I decided to postpone that exhibition until next year. So back in April this year, I found myself with an empty, I knew I was going to have an empty space in August. And with my two interns, we decided to basically re-resurrect re or uh, um, uh, resurface existing works of art that we had already um, exhibiting, exhibited. Mm -hmm. so, um, so basically this exhibition uh, features works by 17 artists, well actually 18 artists. So uh, just to give you a brief sort of a view, I represent 10 artists. Um, and also work with a group of artists called the AGA group. So these would be what other galleries might refer to as project artists. That's a work by Mary A. Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald who is one of our AGA members. So um, the show, um, so there's no theme in the show other than works that were exhibited previously. And which was a huge, <laughs> a huge challenge. When I do thematic shows, and we come back to that, it's always on the theme. Obviously, here I was absolutely spoiled for choice. We have over 300 works of art in our storage area, mm -hmm. so it was all about um, choosing sort of different things that really worked together or that meant something. This is a work by Kelly Ratchford from our exhibition last year called "Cycling Through the Rages." Uh, Kelly is a cyclist and she co-curated the show with me and the show was all about the challenges um, that cyclists have to face in Dublin. So it was a beautiful exhibition which also celebrated the joys of cycling. So this is Kelly Ratchford here. Um, now we have an ex a painting here by one of my represented artists. Kelly is also represented, I should have said. This is work by Claire Halpin. And this work was recently exhibited in the um, High Lanes Gallery in Drada. Um, and that's actually important information for artists out there. Um, um, the gallery has launched, um, it's going to be an annual event. It's an open submission event where galleries can apply to exhibit. And Claire was, got kind of lucky this year. She was shortlisted. And this is a very interesting painting. Uh, Claire started, during COVID, uh, Claire started, documented places of culture that have been used as, as temporary mortuaries. And we know that in Ireland, IMA, the Irish Museum of Modern Arts, was considered. Here, it's that place uh, in Spain, the um, Palacio de Hielo, and um, beautiful uh, work. 
Then we have different works. This is work by one of my Aga artists, Vicky Smith. And this is a, a painting from a show called Between, Somewhere Between Perception and Reality, uh, which I presented at the VIEW Art Fair. So for those who are not familiar with the sort of art fair scene in Ireland, there are two art fairs every year. Uh, unfortunately, this one, the VIEW Art Fair that takes place at the RHA, um, the Royal Hibernian Academy, has been cancelled this year. But what my gallery does, and I've been invited to participate in that art fair since I opened my first gallery in 2012, what I've been doing, and I'm the only one gallery to do it, is to present a themed art exhibition. Yeah. So I will come back to that when we do the presentation uh, later. Um, beautiful work by, by Hugh Cummins. And again, I'll come back to Hugh's work later. And this one is- We're gonna watch a few stills, aren't we? A few still images. Exactly. And this yeah. piece, is, which is beautiful, mm -hmm. it was actually exhibited, I believe, in, in a, a, a two-person exhibition that, that uh, Hugh had with another AGA member, Sheila Norton. And this is in uh, Applewood and Wenge, if I'm correct. Um, you can correct me later if I got this wrong. <laughs> yeah, <I think> you're <laughs> um, <right. laughs> beautiful work by Miriam McConnell. Again, that was part of the show between perception and reality, and it's called Medicine Bottles. Um, really, the idea of the show for me was sort of uh, a few years ago when you know everybody kept talking about fake news, uh, perception, and reality. And this, these are concepts I'm very interested in. And uh, um, these were the two works that that um, uh, Miriam presented. Uh, moving on to, I'm sorry for the reflection there. This is a watercolor. And we talk about watercolors as well because I think I'll maybe debunk the myth, the myth that people, sometimes artists have about galleries not wanting to exhibit watercolors. But anyway, and this is a watercolor by, by Owen McLaughlin. Um, um, this is a series um, that Owen started for the, the annual, um, that was two years ago, well, last year, the Bloomsday exhibition that I have every year, which is also a thematic um, exhibition. And last year I decided to go for the theme of food, food references in Ulysses. And the show was called um, Olives, Oysters and Oranges based on a PhD uh, research paper by Dr. Flicka Small. And uh, Owen went for this sort of the, the, the spud, the Irish the potato, which is a talisman in, in Ulysses. And uh, I think the work has evolved since then, um, but it's beautiful uh, work in, in watercolor. And moving on, this is a painting that I will come back to later. This is a work by David Fox, uh, which was in his solo sh show last year, uh, a show called, let me get this right, An Altered Land. And it's just that when we looked at the painting this time, it took a very different meaning. You know, uh, the idea of children not being able to play, possibly, there's something quite ominous in the current context of, of COVID, I think. Um, as you can notice, the, hang, the painting is hanging very low, uh, which is something that museums tend to do these days. Here I did it because I really want to invite the viewer to actually walk into the painting. And the sky is just as important as, as the rest of the painting, and that's one way of doing it. Um, obviously, as a gallerist, I pay a lot of attention to the way I hang the show. It's a very important thing. Um, based on the fact that it's very difficult these days to keep people's uh, attention span. Mm. You know, people walk into a gallery for different reasons. They might be there for five minutes. You really want to grab their attention. Olivia, so, yes. Just, just as a matter of interest, because I, I find that point very, very interesting. And, and I actually found myself drawn to that because of exactly where you hung it. The fact that it's so low. And, mm. and, and that I, I haven't come across that concept before. Are, are there any particular rules for people if, if they're if they're doing hanging their own work or something like that as to how they should be hung you know should all the tops be level or all the bottoms be level or anything like that are there any rules or are there no rules i think there are different rules for everybody yeah. uh, i tend to center works of art if i go back uh, you can see for instance you know the way I've hung those two. It's whatever looks good for each work of art. So that's the one thing that is the most important thing for me, whether it's a solo exhibition or a group exhibition, you need to do justice to every work of art. Mm. I would say almost forget about the alignment thing. The important thing is obviously the overall view or perception that you can have about the exhibition. And again, you want to make sure that you're not gonna lose people when they walk into the gallery. So whatever is harmonious, I suppose, but, 
it's by looking at the painting here, for instance, you know, I want people to be able to see it. So basically, you know, I'm a small person, I have to take that into account. Most people are taller than me. So it's whatever looks good, whatever height you think is good for you. And yes, obviously, you tend to align them one way or the other. And again, for me, I think centering is better, but that, that's what works for me. But look, I've placed a very, another painting very high above, and this is a work, beautiful work by Geordie Fornes, an artist that is based in Singapore, that I've been representing since 27, um, yes, 27, so quite some time ago. Um, so, um, yeah, um, left, bottom, or center, whatever, but the height is important. What is yeah. it that you want the viewer to see? Here in this painting, you know, I want people to be, to imagine them going towards those swings, you know, and mm. it's such a beautiful sky that um, if I had sort of hung, hung it the way that you would, you could have expected, it would be, have been too high, I yeah. think, you know, so yeah. uh, uh, nothing is left for random, everything is done in, in a certain mm. way. Um, um, this is another beautiful work uh, by um, Yanni Peters. This is quite special. This, ex this work is actually part of National Heritage Week. It's an annual event um, that the gallery participates in every year. Mm -hmm. Usually we do it through a talk at the gallery. This year uh, the whole event is going to be online. So we decided to present a work and Yanni has written a beautiful essay which is available on our website. She has revisited um, this painting that she first exhibited as part of Republic, uh, a show I co-curated with Owen McLaughlin back in 2016 for the centenary uh, commemorations of the Easter Rising. Hmm. And at the time, Yanni decided to, I should have said that the area where I am is really um, Harry Clark's territory. You know, the famous Irish stained glass artist Yes. He lives in the area, he worked in the area, his studio was on North Frederick Street. He's obviously very well represented in, in the Hugh Lane, and he was also a student in Bevedere College, our next door neighbor and landlord. Yes. So I think Yanni had different things in mind, I mean the symbols of the lily in Irish history, but here a reference obviously to the revival of the um, arts and crafts movement in Ireland and obviously obvious reference to Harry Clark as well. Yes. So this is really a painting that is worth seeing in the flesh. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, when I was saying that we leave nothing to random, um, this is work by an artist that I've invited. I don't represent Mark, Mark Newman. Um, but he's the winner of the 2020 RDS um, uh, Craft Awards for Jewelry. And I was really struck by this work, which to me, it's wearable sort of miniature sculptures and they're absolutely uh, beautiful. And this is work that he produced shortly after uh, graduated. And they're really uh, references to different rope configurations. And uh, I have a beautiful text or statement describing what this is all about. But when you start looking at the works and you can see those different sort of uh, uh, rope configurations. And I love the way that Mark decided to use those miniature um, pallets. Uh, is that the right term? Yes, yes. Um, yeah. I, I come from the very small village in France. Um, uh, and I was surrounded by wood cutting factories when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And the specialty of my village is the making of palettes. So for me, it's a very interesting thing to see uh, those palettes in my gallery because my village exports palettes around the world, really, you know? So yes. who knows? I don't think those are coming from my village, but <laughs> it's a Probably nice not. thought all the same. Mm -hmm. And as we were um, basically, you know, putting the exhibition together, um, obviously these are, on, on copper and um, the enameled copper and um, the back is steel. And I was sort of hang, you know, putting those together and we were hanging at Miriam's um, painting here, Miriam, Miriam McCann's painting, Tangled Chairs. And I'd go back to that painting later actually. Yeah. But it was so interesting for me to see those chairs you know, piled up and obviously the metallic structure 
and you know this sort of dialogue with with Mark's work you know the piling yeah. up of the palettes there and that's I thought there was a bit of a conversation you know so I tend to do things like that and I think as long as you don't hijack the intention of the artist you know creating conversations dialogues or inviting the viewer to uh, to those or to creating those conversations I think it's always um, um, a great thing. Oh, just a book there, which is Poetry Ireland. I was, I think I mentioned Poetry Ireland before. I organize a lot of events in my gallery and my gallery is well known for that. We have events around exhibitions and we have a show in November with Nikki Hayden, uh, which is based on poetry and you know, we're gonna get responses from well-known poets in Ireland. But Poetry Ireland being based in the area, they features featured works, uh, works by my artists in some of the um, beautiful um, um, Poetry Island reviews. So this is a work by, by Kelly Ratchford. Um, I think uh, uh, that, that event, Olivier, would be of interest to Autumn Richardson, who's tuning in with us. Yes. Uh, as she's a poet, and um, I'm sure she'd be very interested in that. That's great. Uh, yes, and I've done quite a lot of events. events. Uh, yeah. Last year, for actually for David's exhibition, we got uh, for Poetry Ireland Day. Uh, I got twenty different artists to respond to to uh, twenty different poets, sorry, to respond to David's work, and we organised an event at the gallery where the poets actually read their poetry, and it was fantastic, actually. Very um, good. Uh, speaking of poetry, another artist, um, Susanna Vavra, she's part of our AGA group, and she's a poet as well. Uh, we did a show this year in the midst of COVID back in May, and I'll come back to that. I think it was quite interesting mm -hmm. what we did, uh, Susanna and myself, but I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Susanna calls that type of work a printing, a combination between a painting and a print. She uses transfer prints in the work and also uh, pattern fabrics. Uh, beautiful work. She's some fabulous work, yeah. Sheila Norton, and I'll come back to Sheila's work um, to talk about watercolor later. And um, this is a watercolor and gouache on chamfered uh, birch um, ply, uh, uh, birch plant panel. Uh, beautiful work. Um, I mentioned Nikki Hayden a short while ago. Um, these are two works by Nikki, and again, um, her show in November called Sanctuary will be in the same line of work as these two here. Uh, moving on to uh, work by Annika Berglund. These were actually part of a recent exhibition I did, and I'll come back to it later, which was a drawing on Don Quixote, which I presented as part of the Wexford um, Opera Festival and, and later at View, and then here at the gallery. Uh, Annika is a ceramicist and she explored the idea of, um, of shapes and forms, uh, obviously Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, you know, the obvious sort of uh, uh, representation, you know, and uh, I suppose very flawed characters, but you know, like in any character, there's gold in them and this is real gold, a beautiful thing. And I thought placing Annika's work near uh, Mark Newman's work, who is a jeweler, right? Uh, might be a good idea, might create more dialogues. Uh, work by Ashling Conroy, who will be exhibiting. She, Ashling is a member of the AGA group. Um, very meditative type of work, and Ashling will be exhibiting in a solo exhibition next year with us. And here we have work by John Fitzsimons. Um, I've been representing John's well, for a long, long time now. It's going to be next month. We have a new solo exhibition, uh, which will be a solo exhibition called Time and Space by John, opening on the 7th of September. I'll be promoting this um, this weekend, really. So this is my desk, which is a bit messy right now. Uh, usually there's three others sitting behind this, but with COVID, I had to reorganize the gallery. So I'm sure you saw that small table there. And this is where one of my volunteers sits during the week. I hope I haven't forgotten anybody. I've, yes, I have actually. I've forgotten Conrad Frankel, who is going to have a solo exhibition with us in October this year, an artist from Cork. And um, Conrad has been with me for a very long time as well. So this is our temporary um, exhibition um, uh, gallery. 
and I'm just having just a quick look. I would hate to have missed anybody. Uh, well, um, yeah, but I'm sure we'll come back. I'm to... really sure you've got everyone. Yes. Um, unless unless any we're here. walking no, into no our brass area, the storage yeah. area. Mm. Beautiful work by actually an artist that I don't represent, uh, Cecilia Moore. Um, she took part uh, in our show, uh, Cycling Through the Rages, last year. Um, beautiful uh, piece here. Uh, ceramics are well represented um, at the gallery, uh, as you can see. Uh, and again, this is our storage uh, area. People love this room. I think the idea for people to browse, I mean, you, 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 you've been to the gallery. Uh, yeah, I, actually, what I, what I love about it is it's, it's almost like an antique shop mm. where, you know, you're going to find something hidden behind everything that is an absolute gem. Yes. Uh, you know, and, and it's exactly like that and, and very compelling to mm. run through everything and make sure you've seen everything. So That's I think it's right. a great this, idea. Yeah, this is an interesting work by Hugh Cummins. I did a show a few years ago called Two Degrees Celsius. I asked my artist to respond to climate change and I collaborated with the EPA, Ireland's Environment, Environmental Protection Agency. Mm -hmm. And we, pre we presented a show at the VIEW Art Fair. So um, this, this one is called Thinking Beyond the Bag. Um, obviously, not just reference to plastic bags, but this is, you know, this is used work, so it's work in wood. Uh, absolutely beautiful uh, work here. Mm. Very fine. Yeah. Uh, I saw a nice comment there from Jenny. Thanks, Jenny. <laughs> uh, I've never been called like that, but um, <laughs> I love it. I love the idea. Uh, and again, you know, um, I would invite people to spend as much time as possible in this room. We do, myself and my um, intern staff, we get a lot of ideas from um, the way so many things are juxtaposed together. It gives me ideas for shows as well. And uh, I think it's also based on the idea that, you know, um, an exhibition in a white cube is a clinically clean, not always, but it's a pretty artificial environment. Here, it's closer to what you might have at home. It's a more intimate space. And the idea of mixing abstract with figurative work, um, some of you might know uh, this portrait there, um, it gives, you know, people reassurance, if they need reassurance, that you can indeed combine abstracts, you know, and, and figurative work, you know. So there's a lot of things behind, I mean, the, the, uh, you know, placing all those works together as well. Yes. Uh, and obviously it's lack of space, for in my, you know, we have works on the floor, but again, people like this idea of, 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 of browsing. Um, uh, more work by, by Kelly Ratchford here. Another beautiful uh, watercolor and gouache by Sheila Norton. Um, so there is a lot to be seen, a lot to take in. Um, an interesting thing as well, when you have a lot of works like that, it's a good idea to change the display on a regular basis. You'll find that people coming back to your gallery might think, oh, this is a new work. And you're like, no, it isn't. I've, I've had it for quite some time. You never saw it before because it was placed somewhere else in the space. Yes, <laughs> so, I can imagine that being the case, yeah. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons, by the way, why I decided to open an art gallery. I mean, doing all those exhibitions in various venues, and I love that, and I miss that sometimes, working with a new space. But in terms of people enjoying the experience of going to an art exhibition, and maybe because they, it, is, it can be quite a powerful experience, you know, uh, you know, going to an art exhibition. Works of art can stay with you, and we come back to that later. And years later, you might say, oh gosh, I wish I had purchased that work of art. Well, chances are, if you're lucky, that work might still be available. Mm. So it's not a rare thing for me to sell a work of art that I exhibited two years before, two years later. Yes. Simply because I have a storage area and, you know, so we do get inquiries like this. You know, I saw on your website, you know, this 2017 exhibition, love that piece. Is that work still available? Mm -hmm. So without a gallery, without a storage area, it is more challenging to, um, to respond, you know, to that type of uh, request, you know. Um, okay. So sh should we move on to um, the, the images that we, we've, we've done? In the we moment? did. Let me just go back to my desk. Sure and, uh, yeah. There's no doubt there's plenty to see there, that's for sure. <laughs> 
And there's one, one thing that I know a lot of artists will, will be wondering, and that is how does one get into a gallery? Um, I'm sure there are lots of do's and don'ts in terms of that, but you know. Yeah. Sorry, just a second. I'm just trying to yeah. change the display so that we can see me. Yes. And I'll position this. Yeah. Let me know if you can see me okay. Yeah, Hi, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Last, we see you. Yes. Sure. Yeah, so we, before we get, we get on to that presentation, we, we, could, could you give us um, an idea of that, you know, how people should go about being represented or, because I know it's very, very difficult and I know you've an unenviable position of having to turn a lot of people away. Yes, I think really the attitude um, is to think of it as if you're applying for a job. So it's all about doing a bit of homework first. Yeah. Um, do your homework, which galleries would you like to be represented by and why? And what does the gallery stand for? What type of art do they sell? What type of artists do they represent? Um, artists always think that they're a good fit uh, for a gallery and that's how they present themselves. What do you mean by that? Um, I would say don't make assumptions. Different, all galleries are different. We have different practices. So, um, um, so it's common sense. Now, in my case, um, since I opened my gallery in 2012, I was absolutely inundated <laughs> with requests. So much so, and I always respond, by the way. Some galleries ignore emails. I never do. I always yeah. respond to applications. But to such an extent that we had actually to put a note. It's actually on the contacts page on the website asking artists not to submit. My way of doing it nowadays and most galleries actually are very active. You know, we all, uh, you know, through social media, we know what other artists are up to. We do keep an eye. So it's not like we are passive and waiting for artists to contact us. So we just don't talk about it. That's number one. <laughs> but uh, yeah. number two is the way I do it is my gallery is an institutional member of VAI, Visual Artists uh, oh. Ireland, which is the Association of Artists in Ireland, I would recommend any working artist to become a member of the association. It's for your own interest. Uh, every year, unfortunately, it's, it was cancelled this year, they organize an event called um, Get Together. It used to take place at IMA, the Irish Museum of Modern Art. Uh, in the recent years, it has taken place in DIT. Anyway, it's cancelled this year. And one of there's many events uh, taking part during that day. It's all about artists meeting each other, meeting curators, gallerists, and lovely interactions. Great work by VAI. And there's one event uh, which is called Speed Curating, yeah. whereby artists book in advance gallerists, uh, museum curators, and it's basically a conversation which is timed. It can be can be quite daunting the first time. Not, for the art, not just for the artist, but also for us. Uh, where, but it's a conversation where the artist presents their work. Yes. Whether they're looking for gallery representation or not, but it's a good exercise. Mm. Very artificial, it's a five minute, it's like going for an interview really. But what it does, it, it sort of shows you what kind of questions you're gonna get. What, what is it that a gallerist uh, expect? And again, every year, I would expect people to do their homework. There's no point in coming to me, um, you know, if you, if you, you know, if you think that, you know, your work is not, you know, if, if I don't represent any kind of work like that in my gallery. So it's all about doing, um, um, you know, research, you know. Um, um, there, there are rules of engagement with the galleries. Uh, the one thing we absolutely hate uh, in gallerists, but again, when you think about it, it's common sense. Never, never approach a gallerist at an opening. Okay, exhibition oh. opening, it's a no-go. We are yeah. so busy, so yeah. stressed. Yeah. Uh, our job is to welcome everybody, to sell, to promote the artist's work. Be very discreet. It's great to introduce yourself, but don't start promoting your work. And that has happened to me. And that is not, it's a, it's a no, no yeah. go, you know. Uh, that, yeah. So it's common sense. It's all about common sense. The main advice I would give, make an appointment. Make an appointment in advance. My interns are always surprised. It takes me usually five minutes 
uh, when somebody walks in the gallery to guess whether he or she or they are artists or not. Mm. Just the way an artist looks at an exhibition, um, it comes with years of experience, but it takes me five minutes usually. And my, my interns are always, you know, as soon as the person walks into the other room, I, I know, I tell my interns artists. Yeah. It's just, you know, so I think just do tell almost straight away that you're an artist. You mm. know, don't, you know, especially in the current climate, we're all struggling, you know, and every time somebody walks into the gallery, we hope that they might buy something or well, not. You know, yeah, it's not just about buying. Yeah. But, you know, it's better to be honest. Again, it's common sense. It's yeah. common sense. Okay. But I think uh, making an appointment, if you think, if you know that the gallery is looking for artists, uh, yeah. Um, I think that that's been very useful because it is something that's in the, the, the tip of people's, tongues in terms of you know what what, what how they should uh, you know move their career onwards and you know some people choose not to go to a gallery other people need a gallery mm. very, very much of personality i suppose as well yes I, I see i see another question there um which is an interesting question but maybe we should start the presentation because i think yeah, i'll be answering so, some of those questions we, we'll uh, definitely come back to that because we, we are going to have a q a at the end of it sure so, so let, let's go ahead with that and then we will come back so i'm just going to press the screen share sure and uh, let me just make sure that i have my notes as well just in case <laughs> okay do you want to go back to the first one maybe yeah grace um I chose this picture here just to show what the gallery, what a solo show at the gallery looks like. Uh, this was an exhibition titled Projections um, back in 2017 by John Fitzsimons. In, and it was concerns about the environment. That's one of the work from that exhibition. I decided to put that particular painting here, uh, which was called Dead Sea. Um, the reason why I put that painting here is that I saw that painting Two years later, that shows you what I was saying to you about the storage area, to Deloitte, uh, the well-known uh, sort of financial firm. And uh, for me, uh, that's the reason why I decided to choose that painting here. I want to debunk a bit of a myth that sometimes people have about what type of art do uh, companies buy? And I was told many years ago, well, not so long ago, by the, an interior designer, that's not the type of work that companies buy. Um, sort of thinking that, you know, companies, because of their customers, because of their employees, only buy pretty, pretty pictures. Things have changed a lot, you know. A lot of companies these days, you know, are using works of art, you know, to bring awareness about the environment. That's the case here. So, you know, those assumptions from the past are gone. And this is, we live in a changing world. God knows what's going to happen after COVID, you know, but um, that's the reason why I chose that painting. It's a beautiful painting, but you know, the title is Dead Sea and uh, you can obviously see the silhouette of a whale, what looks like a whale in the very gray sea, you know, and again, this painting is, you know, uh, uh, can be seen in a very public way in a, in a low firm, a financial firm, you know, so. Is it a large painting? Say it again. Is it a large painting? It's about 42 by 50, I think, yes. Uh, so it's not that large. No. Um, yeah, okay. Yes, that's an interesting, so you saw the gallery space before. So this is uh, Unquill. Uh, it's an installation by the artist Owen McLaughlin. Um, he had that uh, installation uh, for his show uh, Dera 4, that's back in 2018, if I'm not wrong, again, one can correct me. Uh, it was a, a show about the, the plight of the Irish forests and again, environmental concerns. Um, Owen installed um, 64, if I'm getting this right, um, uh, rice watercolors on rice paper. I think they measured in height something like four meters, 64. I think it took Owen two or three days to install it. Uh, did not want any help from me or from anybody. He was, I had never seen an artist being so focused. Uh, Owen presented me with a maquette of uh, a few months before that of the installation. So he knew exactly where he was going. It was a beautiful experience for people to walk into the gallery 
and walk through that forest. Um, uh, watercolor um, um, in this exhibition, you know, and again, this idea that galleries don't show watercolors, that's actually not true at all. Uh, in fact, there is a return to watercolor um, in on Owen's ecological case. grounds. So that again? On, on ecological grounds. Uh, maybe from the artist part, mm. not necessarily from us gallerists. No, um, no. When an artist can show you interesting things in watercolors, uh, I think all, all too often uh, certain jars, you know, have been limited to watercolors. Unfortunately, there's so much stuff that you can do with watercolor. And I'll show you, I think, you know, uh, another work by Sheila Norton, you know, to, okay. to illustrate my, my point, you know. But to go back to, if you go back to uh, Unquil, um, it was such a great experience, you know, watching Owen install this. We actually have a film about Owen uninstalling it. It's one of those speed films. On my website, we have a section called Films, and there's over 20 films of exhibitions, artist talks. I would invite people to actually take a look. That will give you a good idea of what the gallery does as well in terms of other events, you know. Um, funnily enough, uh, some people thought the installation was too big for the gallery. I, I think they missed the point. The whole point was about the forest taking over. So Owen knew exactly what he was doing by having this almost, uh, you know, overpowering installation in the gallery. So, um, yeah. Uh, we got really good reviews about that show in the Irish Times, Aidan Dunn, and other art critics as well. So, um, yeah. Um, Lydia, we, we go through them as, as quickly as possible yeah. now. Because I, I need yeah. to leave enough room for Q and A's afterwards. Sure. I sure. doubt there's going to be plenty of them. So yes. we move on. Okay. Watercolors by Sheila Norton, a member. It's called Harbour Two. Again, to show you what people can do with watercolor abstracts. It's watercolor and gouache. Sheila came to see me at the speed curating, and I was so impressed about the type of work that one can do with watercolor and gouache that she became a member of our Aga group. So watercolor again. <laughs> Very good. Beautiful work by Yanni Peters. It's a very glomisé, which is reverse painting on glass or back painting on glass. And that was part of our show, uh, Come With Me, I'll Show You Something Beautiful in 2016. Uh, it was a very proud moment for me because that painting, uh, we sold that painting to the Shirley Sherwood collection in, in Kew in London, the only gallery in the world solely dedicated to uh, botanical art. And Yanni is in that collection. A book was actually published recently about uh, Shirley Sherwood's collection and that work features very highly in the book. Uh, beautiful work. And I will invite you to come to the gallery to see other examples of very glomisé or back uh, painting on glass by Yanni. I actually saw that and I, I, didn't, I didn't realize it was a painting at all. Mm. I actually thought it was, it was you know, uh, actual plant. And it's reverse painting on glass. Yeah, so you, know, you cannot correct your mistakes there. No. Yes. <laughs> Yanni is the only artist in Ireland who does very glomisé. Um, very interesting. Yeah. And this is a close up, presumably. This is a close-up, yes. Yeah. I was very nervous sending that one to London. It's a very big, we had to obviously have a crate <laughs> designed for it, uh, but it arrived very safely. And uh, yeah. I believe this, they kept the crate. That's Yanni's again, for that show, uh, somewhere between perception and reality, here Yanni depicted uh, three, if you like, identical scenes, and uh, the dandelion seen by the human eye, seen by bees' eyes, and seen by butterflies, or butterfly eyes, and we presented those three works. And again, they didn't sell at view, but I saw them later in the gallery. Yeah. Ah, this is us uh, installing an exhibition at view. The reason I wanted to show you that picture, it for me sums up the spirit of the Olivier Cornet Gallery a group of artists working together. I really encourage collaborations at the gallery. Here we have Kelly Ratchford at the top, blonde hair, installing her, uh, her piece, uh, aided by Claire Halpin, and we have Owen McLaughlin, and we have Hugh holding it all together, and one of my interns, I think she was looking for a photo opportunity, and it's me taking the picture. Uh, not that I don't do the dirty work, I do, but here I was just taking the picture. But for me, it's, it's, a, it's a, yeah, that's me there. And behind another exhibition, uh, Hopscotch, mm -hmm. it was an exhibition on childhood memories and children's games. What was quite interesting about the show is that I collaborated with Fighting Words, which is a center in Dublin that encouraged writing by young writers. And I got basically each, um, basically each work of art is accompanied by a text 
written by a young writer and you should have seen the faces of their parents very proud having their kids represented through text at view the art fair beautiful experience some of the artists changed the titles of their of their uh works because of the titles that the, the, the young writers had given their text. Yeah. This is uh, some of those young writers and actually behind them you can see a piece, the bottles there, a, a piece by you Cummins and if you move to the next, this one, I'm going fast as fast as I can. I know, it's I appreciate maternal that. Care, maternal Care, it's a piece in, I think, um, is that Mahogany and Bird's Eye? I can't remember. Uh, I, I will talk about it later. I have that in my notes somewhere. Yeah. Um, the great thing about that piece um, was that it was acquired by the OPW, uh, the organization in Ireland, uh, you know, that purchases works of art yes. for inclusion in the collection of the Irish state. Mm. And later that, that work was included in one of the touring um, exhibitions that the OPW organizes every year. So um, we were able to see Hughes work in various locations, even in Belfast, for instance, where the tour went at some stage. Beautiful piece. Beautiful, beautiful, yeah. This is another exhibition that I presented at VIEW, Elevation. I asked the artist to respond to Charles Baudelaire's poetry. I'm a huge fan of Charles Baudelaire, and for me it was almost a dream come true, doing something with Charles Baudelaire. Beautiful poem, Elevation. And this is the, um, the show there. Uh, actually, the Big Sky from by, by Owen uh, was sold to um, another corporation recently. So, um, yeah. Thanks. That's me there in front of the work by Hugh, and that's the piece by 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 John, oh, yeah. John Fitzsimons. Uh, yeah. this, this was for the two degrees uh, two degrees Celsius uh, exhibition on on climate change. There's been a lot of writing about that exhibition. It was very well received. Um, um, yes. Very good. This is the one I was talking about, drawing on Don Quixote. I was invited by the committee of the Wexford uh, Opera Festival to choose an exhibition, uh, to do an exhibition of my choice. And one of the um, operas last year was the uh, Don Quixote by the French Jules Massenet. And when I found out that Jules Massenet was born in the same city as my mother and my two sisters, I thought, that's it. I'm, I'm going to ask the artist to respond, not so much to the, the opera, but to the original novel by, um, by, by Cervantes. So a great exhibition, I think. And that's work by Nikki Hayden there. All right. Beautiful work again by Nikki Hayden, very similar to the wall piece that I showed you early on, except here it's ceramics. Um, beautiful use of gold again in what is porcelain. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Ah, you know, a work of art that, you know, enters your mind and never leaves it. That's the work by Conrad Frankel um, that I presented as part of another group show, Flanneries in Forests and Fields and beautiful painting that are very reluctantly sold uh, to the OPW. So it is in the collection of the Irish State, but it's an absolute beauty. Uh, beautiful. Compared to so many other famous artists, uh, Irish artists like Tony O'Malley or, or even David Hockney, uh, you know, and, but it's just, it's a unique. By the way, I've started documenting all the exhibitions um, all the exhibitions, all the works that we've sold to different organizations. It's on the website. It's mm. called uh, Artworks in Public and Corporate Collections. So you can browse, it's in the artist's menu, yeah. and you can basically browse through that and gives mm. you an idea of what it is, the type of work that different corporations um, acquire. Very good, very good. That's useful, thank you. Beautiful work by Miriam McConnell, um, um, Domestic Resistance, and that was in 2019, last year. Beautiful exhibition on, on um, works um, sort of inspired by women that were in the position of displacement at some stage. So Miriam interviewed a group of refugee women or women who had experienced, you know, asylum seeking and things like that, asking them to select works of, that meant something at some stage. And this um, painting depicts uh, a banknote, a Syrian banknote, a very beautiful exhibition, which was very successful last year, Domestic Resistance. By the way, all the exhibitions, you can have a look at them. We have archives in the exhibitions page, so you can go back in time, in time, sorry, and have a look at various exhibitions that we organized in the past. Very good. Another beautiful uh, painting, that's uh, Counterpoint by Geordie Fornis. 
a Spanish artist who used to live in Ireland and that I've been representing for a long, long time. He's based in Singapore. Jordi has a PhD in compound chemistry, so a very interesting artist. He's able to mix things that nobody can. He, has, he also has a very strong interest in music and has been studying about, you know, music and visual arts, painting, and uh, uh, he's a mu he, he composes music as well. And uh, this is that painting, I could have sold it 15 times. Everybody wanted to buy it. It did go to a good home in the end. Can you recall what, what it was titled? Counterpoint, it had actually the okay. title of the exhibition. Maybe that's the reason that's why right. yeah, it yeah. sold so quickly. Yeah, no, it had the title of the actual mm -hmm. exhibition. Uh, yeah. We have a catalog about this exhibition in the gallery, so yeah. people are more than welcome to come and have a look. Ah, interesting. Susanna Vavra and her solo show, uh, Zitfleisch, which I was going to cancel. It was supposed to take place in May. And with Susanna, we decided to basically do it online. So to cut a long story short, uh, Susanna and myself did a lot of research. Uh, we created a virtual space. We now have on the website a virtual space where people can walk into a virtual gallery. And we did that with Susanna, with her, with her show. And uh, Susanna was absolutely great helping me to create that uh, virtual exhibition. And I'm now using that virtual. So every physical exhibition in the gallery has a kind of equivalent, physical equivalent online in this 3D uh, virtual space. And here, uh, Susanna and myself went, we went streaming. Um, we went streaming on Facebook mm -hmm. and we basically, we launched the exhibition online. So this is something that I do now. We launch online. I can't have crowds at an opening in the gallery. So if the artist is okay with that, not everybody wants to go online. Um, but it was a brilliant experience. All these have been recorded and they are available again in the films and clips uh, page on the website. And it gives you a nice insight into the artist's practice and the way we went about this exhibition uh, at the peak of COVID. Yeah. I think we've already talked about that painting. Mm. I just wanted people to be able to see it. You know, the swing, yeah. beautiful painting. This should go to a good collection, really. Yes. <laughs> I agree, I agree. And finally. Yes, finally, the reason why I wanted to have that painting, uh, Miriam, who is based in Cyprus, she's Irish, but she's based in Cyprus, sent me that painting for a 2017 exhibition in Life's Pockets, uh, which was all about the recontextualization of everyday objects. For some reason at the time, uh, we didn't think that painting gelled with the rest of, of, with the other paintings, which were more interior paintings, and we, we just put it aside, and it was aside in the storage area. And when I saw it preparing for this resurfacing exhibition, it made so much sense to me. And it shows that there is a time for every painting, you know, or there's a time for every exhibition. It might not be the right time, it might not be the right painting for the right time, but this is now, I think, the main painting in the show. Yeah. I'm not saying that I dismissed that painting before, but it was not suitable for that exhibition then, and now it makes so much sense to have it. It shows that don't, as an artist, you know, don't despair mm -hmm. if nobody's yeah. looking at your work because there's a time for everything. Very good, very good. Okay. Um, I went as fast as I could. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I appreciate that. I know that's not easy. It's I hope funny. I haven't made so many mistakes. I have notes. Uh, <laughs> please, uh, if any artist is attending and wants to correct what I've said, just go yeah. ahead. <laughs> yeah, you're very good. And listen, thank you so much. Um, uh, there's a few questions here which I'll deal with. There's one particular one. If, if it's not asked, I'll certainly ask. Um, uh, yes, you've seen that. You're just thinking about spaces that always elicits a very focused experience. There's nothing distracting about it. Who is in, yeah, and very good, yeah. Yeah, Autumn has, how do you personally choose an artist that you would like to represent? How do you personally choose an artist that you would like to represent? I can't really answer that. I mean, I can in a, in a way, um, you know, I need, I see a lot of works. I see hundreds of works every year, whether it's online or through uh, VAI. It's, I need to see where the artist is going. I, I, you know, it all, it's all about being articulate about your work, your practice, mm -hmm. where you see, you know, I'm not saying that's easy for any artist to produce a great work, but I think in a way it is. For me, it's 
how do I see this, how, where, where do I see the artist going in the future? Mm -hmm. And I can only get that through a discussion. So my AGA group is that it gives me time and members of the AGA group, we work together, we see where we're going with different things. And this is important for me, the present, but also the future. Where is the artist going? What is the potential, yes. you know? Yes, yes. Okay, and, and, and on that point, and, and you, you've made a lot of very interesting points throughout your, your, your presentation there, um, and particularly about the way things are going, um, the fact that you have a virtual uh, sp space as well as your, your physical space, and mm -hmm. that you're starting to stream and you're starting to do all sorts of things, and we are starting to do what we're doing here. Um, how do you see the future for Olivier Cornet? Well, it's difficult to predict the future. Who knows? I mean, we're yeah. still in pandemic, you know, but certainly uh, if one has learned anything, we need to adapt. Uh, right. There's a lot of discussions. I'm lucky because in, in parallel to this career as a gallerist, I still work in IT and I was very familiar with uh, Zoom meetings and all kind of stuff because that's mm. a, a way of life in IT. So for me, it was very interesting to yeah. apply that knowledge and experience that I have from IT to having all those discussions with my artists, which I did. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's going to be a changed world and the arts world has to adapt. Mm. Everybody should familiarize themselves with online events and, you know, participating in events like this because I think this is the way forward. Now, having said all that, nothing replaces you know the experience of walking into a gallery or a museum so i'm not saying that you know you know the virtual world is going to replace the um the real one i, I hope not um because for me nothing replaces you know the experiencing in the flesh yeah. but all those activities and there's been a lot of interesting things going on online mm -hmm. i've done uh, i've curated art exhibitions online with museums in the UK on themes, some on, on Twitter. Twitter is a good one, by the way. I would invite people to pay, pay more attention to Twitter. Yep. There's a lot of things happening on Twitter with visual art, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so the future for the gallery, uh, well, you know, I'm still a very young gallery. You know, I opened my first gallery in 2012. That's a very young gallery, so I still have a lot to go. I'd like to start participating in international art fairs, if I can. Um, I'd love to curate an art exhibition for a museum at some stage. I hope I'd get the invitation. Um, working with the constraints of a museum, that's something I'd love to do at some stage. Um, more collaborations. You know, I, I collaborate, I mentioned poets, but I've collaborated with playwrights, musicians, and things like that. So most of my artists are into that as well, the collaborative approach. That's, that's the future, I think. Yes. Especially in Ireland, where not everybody is into visual art having those events, whether it's a poetic response to an art exhibition, that can really work. How do you choose? How do you choose uh -huh. their exhibition themes? Yes, yeah. that's a very interesting question because uh, I think Miriam keeps saying that to me, you inspire us. And I said, no, I'm not the one inspiring you guys. The themes that I choose, I always look at where my artists are at. And because I represent a very eclectic group of artists, you know, you've seen it today, it's difficult to find a theme. Uh, so it's topical, fake news, the environment, but at the same time, I do look at where my artists are as a group, yeah. individually. And then I might actually hone on to one piece of art. Years ago, I used one of John Fitzsimons painting, which was an abstract. And I said, that's it, I'm gonna do a show. I already have John's painting and the others will have to respond to it. So it's topical, it's um, themes of interest to me, um, but I do look at, at what my artists are at, you know. Yes. Artists at the end of the day live in, the, in their times, you know, so chances are there's some there's commonality between them, I think. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. Okay, anybody else got a question that you'd like to put verbally or, or on, on the chat? Don't be shy. Even things that you might disagree Alan. with, it's always good. <laughs> yeah. Who is that? Alan, if I may. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Hi, lovely Hi. to see you. Thank you for a wonderful introduction to Olivier's space. Thank you, Olivier. I've been to your space a few times. I had the pleasure of seeing Owen's installation. Um, unfortunately, I missed you that day, Olivier. It was a stunning exhibition. But my one question for you, if you wouldn't mind, is what is the difference to you in the artists that you represent in the gallery and the artists that you are in your AGA group, I think you called it? And what is your AGA group? 
Yes, so Aga, other galleries would re refer to them as project artists. It's a mm -hmm. different level of commitments. If you like, there's more freedom on both sides. They can basically exhibit elsewhere, not in a commercial gallery, but uh, in Dublin, but they could exhibit in a commercial gallery in another county, for instance. There, so there's an element of freedom. The reason why I created that group is that for me, and I think it's an important element, working with an artist, it's a work, it's a work relationship based on mutual respect, um, where, you know, we have to discuss expectations. Having a group like the Aga group of artists, which are at an earlier stage in the career, allows me and them to see if we can work together. So it's almost like, not a test, but you know, it, it is um, um, an in-between space. Years ago at Speed Curating VAI, there was one particular artist, and I'm not gonna give her a name, and everybody wanted to represent her. And I was so keen, started going to her studio and when I explained to her what it would mean to be represented, what is the commitment uh, from the artist to the gallery in terms of not exhibiting with anybody else, all sales going through the gallery, all those things that are important, I scared her, <laughs> I think. And as a result, she went to another gallery and that was a lesson for me. That was a lesson. I thought, because unfortunately in art colleges, they don't, talk, they don't always talk about those things and I think they should. They should talk about what it is to be represented by the gallery. As a result, I decided to, to do that group because it's one way for the artists to see, can they work with Olivier Cornet long term? <laughs> so that's, that's part of it. It's part of it. It also allows me to rep I only represent 10 artists. Now, the reason why I only represent 10 artists, that's actually a good, for me, a good thing because it's international. For me, the basic rule is you should be in a position to give any of your represented artists a solo exhibition every two years if they so wish. How on earth do you do that if you represent 20 artists? Yeah. My commitment to these artists would not be what it should be. So I really believe in that. I get very suspicious when I see a gallery saying that they represent more than 20 artists because there's 12 months in a year. There's only six months that you can use for a solo exhibition. March, April, May, September, October, November. The other months, either people are away, have no money, you're not going to do a solo show in January. <laughs> you know, I, I, I would advise against it. So in my case, I also do group exhibitions. I do the Bloomsday June exhibition every year in collaboration with the Gen Joy Center. Um, you know, so... That leaves me with six months for a solo show. So, so how, that's how long. Yeah. How, how long would an exhibition typically last? Two uh -huh. weeks. I, I I correct you on that. Not correct yeah. you, but I rephrase that. How long should an exhibition last? Yeah. If you're serious, for me, if you're serious about representing an artist, if you want the press to take notice, hmm. there's a lot of exhibitions in Ireland. You know, very little space. Unfortunately, don't get me started on that for visual art. Yeah. Um, three weeks. Three weeks is yeah. the minimum. Uh, mm. You're not going to ask an artist to dedicate, dedicate 12 months the previous year or six months or even three months mm. for a one week exhibition. Mm. Now, <laughs> so, uh, you know, yeah. that's, a good um, that's a good question. Uh, yeah. And the, the, the other interesting thing you said to me is, is that very, very often people won't buy at the opening of an exhibition, but it could be, you know, towards the end of the exhibition or indeed well after it. No, no, well, you would hope that people buy at, at an opening. Um, cool. No, yeah. no, I was saying they might not buy during the whole exhibition. You know, some work might remain unsold, but you could yeah. sell them later. Um, yeah, it's, it's great when work sells at an opening. It's, it gives you and the artist sort of confidence, you know, it's an important yeah. thing, but it doesn't always happen that way. Yeah. Um, but it can. Yes, I mean, you know, there's people might not buy at an opening for whatever reason. It's difficult to see a work of art at an opening. People attending an opening, I always say, you should come back, you know? Yeah. And the opening is more like to celebrate the artist, the start of the exhibition, but uh, at the gallery here, um, not at the moment, obviously, but things can get really, really busy. We do openings on Sunday afternoons. Um, 
I did, I'm the only gallery to do that in Dublin. Uh, typically it's on Thursday evenings. I've never believed in that. People yeah. don't stay. They move from one exhibition to the next. I prefer to have it on a Sunday afternoon. People can come with their families and their kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, my advice would be, and I know if you're not represented, and I hope you don't have to pay for space, so that's the thing, you know, um, doing a three-week exhibition can be a, an expensive exercise, but yeah, that would be my advice. Mm. Okay, very good. Okay, any other questions before we wrap up for today? No? Okay, if anyone does have any questions, they can always email me, um, and I'll pass them on to Olivier. Uh, for you, okay. So, Olivier, and uh, do you have anything else to say before before we? Before no, I wrap? Uh, well, I'll be happy to. Yeah. I would say, you know, my gallery has a very strong um, social media presence. I tweet every day, Facebook, Instagram, you name it. Mm. So there's a lot of things going on. So um, the website is what it is. I think it's a good website. Uh, but yeah, social media is important these days, I think. As an artist, I know there's a lot of artists attending today. You cannot, um, you know, myself, I was very reluctant initially because I thought that was going to be so time consuming, but I actually enjoy it, um, writing social media and promoting the art through social media. It's an important aspect of, of any gallery at this, at this stage. So I invite people to really join those social media platforms if you want to follow a gallery, for instance, you know. Uh, come to the gallery, you know, I open six days a week and for me it's always a great experience to see people walking in, whether you buy or not, you know, that's not the, you know, the primary, you know, so, um, yeah. Well, listen, that's great. Um, Olivier, you, you, you must be the most proactive gallerist in, in, in town. <laughs> because, I don't know. You know I think you're not constrained by your physical presence. In, in, the in one thing I would say is that I've noticed a lot of Dubliners mm. are not fully aware of all the galleries and I'm going to promote my competitors here. There are a lot of commercial galleries in Dublin mm. and the most visible ones are not necessarily the best ones. Um, and I know it can be quite intimidating to ring at the door. That's how you have to enter the Olivier Cornet Gallery. But rest assured that any gallerist is happy to see you. So don't hesitate, ring those doors. Um, at my gallery, my interns learn, the first thing my interns have to learn is that we have to welcome people with a smile because it can be quite intimidating, you know, ringing at the door, but do. There are a lot of galleries in Dublin. Um, things are difficult for them as well, um, you know, um, and for their artists, you know, so we need your support and, um, you know, but don't hesitate. Um, unfortunately, the media in Ireland, the, the, the written media don't always give uh, visual art the space it deserves. Yes. You know, I won't give any names, but if you open, you know, newspapers, compare the amount of pages dedicated to visual art compared to music or books. Absolutely. And I love music, I love books, yeah. but have a look and uh, you'll yeah. see what I mean, you know. And Television could well. do a much better job as well. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, Olivier, there's a, a number of uh, lovely bits of feedback here, like for Tom, thank you for a totally different perspective. <laughs> uh, Regine, thank you, very illuminating and very generous sharing. Um, and Jenny, I know that's a, that's a question. I tell you what, I think we're, we're so over time that, that I'm, I'm going to have to forego. I can that. stay on. Are you, are you staying yeah. on for a few well, minutes? We're going to stay, we're stay on, uh, 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 unofficially afterwards. So that we yeah, can all, I don't uh, mind. Uh, Things are quiet right now. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah, okay, we'll do that. But, but just for the formal point of view, um, on behalf of everybody, I'd like to thank you so much for giving your time. You're a very generous man. You're a very honest man. And uh, it's been so refreshing listening to you. Uh, you, you, you shared so much with us. Um, I, I'm a lot of galleries are like me. Maybe I'm more vocal than the others. Uh, <laughs> so, no, I think there's, there are a lot of myths about yeah. galleries. You know, I know a lot of galleries in Dublin. I can tell you they're all passionate about what they do. So sometimes it's about perception. You uh, know what I was saying about maybe, perception and reality? <laughs> maybe it's the French in you, but you come across completely differently. <laughs> all right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, listen, thank you so much, Olivier. I'm Thank sure you. a lot of us will... Let's stay on anyway, so... Yeah, um... yeah, do. We beat a path to your door. And to everyone else who's been listening, to, to our friends in Canada, Jack, Trish, uh, to Colleen in uh, uh, Texas, to Joy in the Netherlands, I think, um, Miriam in Cyprus, I'm leaving somebody out, Germany, Suzanne, no, is it Suzanne? Suzanne yeah. would be Germany, yes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Northern Ireland, Ireland, and... It's, it's, just, it's just wonderful to have so many of you here. And I deeply appreciate it. And thank you so much. Next thank week you. is another week. 
So who knows what the future is going to bring, uh, but we'll definitely be here at 10 o'clock next Saturday. So thank you all for, for, for coming along. And thank you again, Olivia, for, for being so generous with your thank time. Thank you, everyone, for attending. <clears throat> Bye now. <laughs>